Okay, I think it's 4.10 and it's about time that we get started. Uh, my name is Michael Perella. I'm a professor and chairman of the Department of Entomology and I'm pleased to introduce the store lecturer for, for uh, today. And I have prepared two slides so that I can do her, do her some justice here. Uh, as many of you know, the store lecturer in the College of Biological Sciences is really designed to bring outstanding scientists to the Davis campus that obviously do outstanding science, but they make a much broader contribution to society. And I think we do have a, a distinguished lecturer that certainly fills that bill. Dr. Mae Berenbaum received her BS degree in biology, summa cum laude from Yale University. From there to Cornell University, where she received her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. And then from there to the Department of Entomology at the University of Illinois, where she is currently professor and chair, and is one of the best departments of entomology of its kind in, in the nation. Uh, I, you can see some of her, uh, her activities and her research. Uh, clearly, she has worked in the area of chemical interactions between insects and host plants. Uh, and the implications for community organization and for uh, species evolution. So that's really where she's made her mark as a scientist. But beyond that, she has taken that information and really brought it to a much, much larger audience. She has published uh, uh, three books on insect fact and folklore that are highly regarded, published numerous, numerous articles in trade magazines uh, as a regular uh, individual that testifies in terms of science policy in front of the, uh, uh, our, our USDA and, and government officials. So so, you know, really at a, at a pivotal point there in terms of determining sort of funding strategies for, for, the, for, the, uh, for, 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 our, for the U.S. government. So, you know, some very, very important things. Uh, basically, the honors she has received are numerous, and I've listed a few of them here. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. She's also a fellow of five societies, including the uh, AAAS, and then two ESAs, the Entomological Society of America and the Ecological Society of America, also the American Philosophical Society as well. Uh, in 2011, she received the, U the prestigious USC Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement and you can read it there. It's given to those individuals who have contributed an, in an outstanding manner to scientific knowledge and public leadership to preserve and enhance the environment of the world. She was also, uh, so in 2016, she will be the fifth uh, female president of the Entomological Society of America. We'll, she will preside over the meeting in 2016, and it's a special meeting because it is the site of the International Congress of Entomology that will be held in Florida. It'll be the largest collection of entomology ever in one place at one time. I think we expect more than 7,000 people to attend that meeting. And one of her claims to fame as well is that she interacts quite a bit with television and with Hollywood, and uh, she consulted on a number of, of episodes of the X-Files. And in fact, in one of those episodes, they actually named a character after May. And, uh, and uh, basically, I know there's probably many of you who are fans of the X-Files in the audience, and perhaps you haven't seen uh, that particular episode, so I'm going to correct that deficiency in your life now, and I'm going to show a 40-second clip from the episode where basically May consulted and where the main character has been named after her. So you have to listen carefully. And I'll say one more thing. Of course, the X-Files episode has got to be about insects. This one is about cockroaches, but they're not just any cockroaches. These cockroaches happen to be uh, alien robots from outer space. Okay, so keep that in mind when you see this, uh, this little snippet. Well, maybe you're not going to see it. Dr. Berenbaum, USDA, Agricultural Research Service. Well, Dr. Berenbaum, I'm going to have to ask you a few questions. Can you tell what kind of cockroach it is? I should be able to. The abdomen's still attached, and we differentiate species by their genitalia. Oh, my God. Is it abnormal? I'll say. He's hung like a club-tailed dragonfly. Excuse me. Does it still look unusual? Well, yes, for an insect genitalia, but maybe not for a microprocessor. Okay, please join me in welcoming Mae Berenbaum. Well, uh, am I on? 
Am I unmuted? Yes. Well, interest of full disclosure, I actually didn't consult on that episode, War of the Copperphages. What happened is the screenwriter, Darren Morgan, used several of my books as background um, and inspiration for dialogue. And uh, I saw that when it aired in 1996, and I was well, I, I noticed in TV Guide that the character was named Dr. Berenbaum spelled the same way, and I, not even all my relatives spelled the name the same way. I knew this could not be a coincidence. And then Dr. Berenbaum started saying things that I had said, which was very eerie, and it took me a, a year and a half, actually, to get in touch with the screenwriter. It was a guy named Darren Morgan who said, yes, he had um, uh, used my book, so it came time to naming the character. He thought Dr. Berenbaum sounded like an entomologist. So, But the, uh, I, you know, she's... I, I did ask, um, she was supposed to be sort of a, uh, if you know the show, a co competition for Scully. And uh, I, I, his, his plan for Dr. Berenbaum was that she was indeed supposed to be, a, and I'm quoting here, luscious babe. So you can see that departs a little bit from reality. Um, and every year, we're, I'm never going to finish on time, every year we have an insect fear film festival. And our 30th anniversary, our 30th festival, I took a chance and invited uh, Chris Carter the director, writer, creator, and producer of the X-Files to come to our all X-Files program. And much to my shock and amazement, Chris Carter came in a private plane uh, to central Illinois in February to our X-Files festival. The, the truth about insects is out there. And uh, he brought along Darren Morgan. So we actually, you'll appreciate this, Nathan Schiff made sure to bring a club-tailed dragonfly to show Darren Morgan what exactly that those genitalia look like. So, so it was a thrill for all of us, I guess. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored. Davis is a, has a, is a storied department. And uh, it, I am uh, delighted at how many people I know and have connections to. So thank you. Um, as for being president in 2016, I hate to hear that this is the largest assembly of entomology in the history of the discipline, because, you know, if I mess up, this is the end of my career. I mean, there's no place to hide after that. So anyway, let's hope it goes well. First one in 40 years. So, um, right, Apis mellifera. Uh, Linnaeus, Carlo, Carolus Linnaeus knew what he was doing when he called this species Apis mellifera, the bee that carries honey, um, because for thousands of years, the principal interest that humans have had in honey, in honeybees, is as a source of honey, one of the very, very rare sources of concentrated sweetness in the world. And bees obligingly do the concentration themselves, package them up in nice uh, airtight uh, wax containers, and uh, it's there for the taking with only the minor inconvenience of dealing with an angry swarm of, of, of uh, uh, passionate defenders. So humans have valued this product for a very long time. Eventually, uh, minimized the risks associated with gathering it to, and semi-domesticated honeybees. Uh, and they were primarily domesticated for honey. And it, it's really astonishing that the realization that honeybees are uh, important contributors to the human diet through pollination is a relatively recent vintage. We've really only known that insects in general are pollinators for less than 300 years. Uh, and in the history of science, it's a rel relatively late realization. Now, Apis mellifera is the world's uh, premier managed pollinators because of certain unique attributes of its biology. Uh, it's really designed uh, to be a managed pollinator. Among other things, as a eusocial species, it has a, a very large colony size, 30 to 50,000 farm workers, if you will. Uh, so that, that is a force for pollination that uh, can manage uh, the extensive monoculture crops that are characteristic of contemporary U.S. agriculture. Uh, honeybees are famous for having an elaborate communication system uh, that allows an individual forager to return to the hive and direct her nest mates to an abundant source of pollen or nectar, uh, thereby uh, enforcing flower fidelity or revisits the same species which promotes pollination. Um, they also are remarkable. This is a, uh, a perennial colony. Unlike many, even social species, these uh, 30 to 50,000 individuals are maintained year-round. So the honeybee has a, a very long uh, active season from early spring through late fall. So they have a phenomenal capacity to handle uh, many different kinds of flowers. They have a need to handle many kinds of flowers. And the uh, the intellect or ability to learn to handle the different floral structures. 
And then finally, um, they are by nature cavity nesters. So they like in nature to build their nests inside hollowed out uh, structures like uh, uh, rotten tree, dead trees and the like. So they take very well to living in human fabricated boxes where you can pick up an entire colony, put it in the back of a flatbed truck and drive it for 2,000 miles to deliver pollination services. So they are um, extremely well suited for managed pollinators by by virtue of their biology. It wasn't really until the mid-19th uh, century that uh, humans started to manipulate these biological attributes uh, to improve uh, beekeeping and bee management. And, and best known for the uh, applying insights about bee biology to enhance management was Reverend L.L. L. Langstroth of Philadelphia, who invented what's called the movable frame hive. And he observed that uh, honeybees inside their cavities um, if they encountered a space that was a little bit more than three-eighths of an inch across, they would uh, fill it with wax cells and use it to store honey or, or put brood. If it was smaller than three-eighths of an inch or so, they would perceive it as a defect or a flaw and seal it with a resinous material gathered from plants called propolis. But three-eighths of an inch or so, they leave alone. And they leave it alone because they need pathways or corridors through that structure. So this is what he called or was, what was called bee space. And he cleverly figured out that if you build a box and construct a wooden frame and leave three eighths of an inch around that frame, uh, you can pick it up and, and, uh, uh, without killing the bees. The biggest hurdle in, in something on the order of 9,000 years of beekeeping was harvesting honey without hurting the bees. So this was a brilliant innovation, uh, in techno a technological improvement that allowed beekeepers uh, to remove honey, uh, take a frame, remove the wax caps, drain or spin out the honey, and then replace them. So this had many benefits, not the least of which was uh, bees make uh, wax. It's an abdominal uh, glandular secretion. It takes about uh, 8 to 10 pounds of honey to make a pound of wax. So bees didn't have to refabricate the wax. And it also enabled, for the first time, beekeepers to actually monitor what was going on inside the colony. So this was a, 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 a huge innovation. And it was the first... Uh, uh, innovation, the first manipulation of, of uh, bee biology, the first of many that started in the mid-19th century and continued. So among the, uh, this, this inadvertent experiment in Apis mellifera biology, so starting in 1852 beyond bee space uh, and the movable frame hive, uh, steamship travel made it feasible to bring over uh, bees from elsewhere in the world. The Apis mellifera, the, the western honeybee, is actually not native. No Apis species is native to the New World. Bye-bye. 
sexual behavior is that beekeepers had no control over the genetics because they couldn't determine which, which uh, drones would be the sires. So artificial insemination gave humans some control over uh, the genetic composition of the bees they were using uh, the, in apiculture. Starting in 1907 for rail transportation, 1925 for trucks, beekeepers hit upon the idea of, of using bees year-round for pollination. This was an in, in, uh, innovation by Nephi Miller, who was keeping bees in Utah and regretted the, the downtime imposed by winter and figured out that he could transport bees by train to California to pollinate oranges and orange groves. Um, Rail companies weren't too happy about this, so ultimately uh, transportation went to trucks, and it's still the practice today. Starting in 1955, uh, a new group of chemicals were introduced into the hive, the antibiotics. Uh, be, they, and they were introduced so beekeepers could improve uh, treatment of varial, various bacterial diseases to which bees were susceptible, including fowl brood, Panabacillus larvae, which is called fowl brood because basically this bacterial infection reduces the grubs to a foul-smelling goo. So antibiotics were introduced. Starting in 1978, work actually done um, by Roy Barker uh, at, uh, um, in, in Arizona determined that uh, high fructose corn syrup was a satisfactory overwintering food for honeybees so that beekeepers could actually divert more honey. Uh, instead of feeding bees honey during the the winter months, they could actually substitute, instead of honey, high fructose corn syrup and keep their, their uh, colonies going. Starting in 1986, a total disaster for the apiculture industry was the inadvertent introduction of an ectoparasite, a Varroa destructor, a little uh, mite that actually uh, has a long coevolutionary association with the eastern honeybee, Apis serrana, uh, but underwent a host shift around this time, ended up in the U.S., and had an absolutely devastating impact on, on uh, honeybee populations. The presence of Varroa, starting in 1986, led to, in 1991, the introduction of pesticides, acaricides, chemicals designed to kill mites directly into the, to the beehive. So antibiotics, then we have pesticides being applied directly by the beekeeper. Uh, starting in 1990, um, another incursion of genes in the form of African bees. Apis mellifera scutellata is a, uh, one of about two dozen races of bees. It's native to Africa. was brought over in 1957 to Brazil by Warwick Kerr, a bee geneticist, who cr uh, correctly reasoned that Apis mellifera ligustica, the Italian bee that's used in the U.S. The, up to that point, was used widely in apiculture uh, in in Brazil was not adapted, it was adapted to Mediterranean and not tropical climates, so he thought bringing over a tropical bee would make for better apiculture. It does, but this was a very aggressive bee that has subsequently uh, moved northward and, and crossed the border into the U.S. in 1990 at Brownsville, uh, Texas. And starting in 2004, something I don't need to tell this crowd, um, the almond industry changed beekeeping. Uh, by lobbying Congress to get an exemption from the 1922 Honeybee Act passed by Congress to prevent the importation of live bees from anywhere else in the world to protect them from foreign diseases. And the reason for the need uh, for bees from overseas is that U.S. bee supplies were inadequate to meet the demand of the uh, burgeoning almond industry, which uh, was increasing, well, by 2006 was a uh, $2.5 billion industry. Uh, and Amer half of America's bees were imported into almond orchards in February every year because every almond is the result of a pollination event and only bees were practical as managed pollinators. So here, in a relatively short period of time, there are all kinds of changes uh, that uh, were thrown at the honeybee genome. So if you look at the evolutionary history of the honeybee, the Genus originated, the genus Apis originated about 60 million years ago. This was a bee specialized for feeding on pollen and nectar and living in eusocial colonies. Uh, this uh, Apis differentiated from other species of cav cavity nesting honeybees about 6 million years ago. So there are about, depending on what systematist you talk to, 7 to 9 species of Apis. And Mellifera differentiated about 6 million years ago. Uh, after that differentiation event, the species itself differentiated into multiple subspecies or races across Africa, the Middle East, and Europe uh, about one million years ago. And less than 200 years ago, 
Honeybees have been subjected to a human-mediated transport across continents, hybridization between hitherto separated races, artificial selection, exposure to novel selection agents, including uh, antibiotics and pesticides, all less than 200 years ago. So the question that arises, does the essentially 60 million year old genome have enough variation to meet these new challenges, at least the genus apes? Well, maybe it doesn't. In uh, 2006, I uh, chaired a, a committee uh, that was convened by the National Academy of Sciences to examine the status of pollinators in North America. And uh, uh, this committee of experts in all kinds of pollinators looked specifically at the honeybee industry, at least in part because data were available through the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And what we noticed was a demonstrable decline in the stocks of American honeybees. And in fact, on page 118, we wrote, U.S. commercial honeybee population was stable from 1996 to 2004, but if it were to continue to decline at the rates exhibited from 1947 to 1972 and from 89 to 96, there would be no commercial viable apiculture industry by 2035. Well, Co coincidentally, that very same month that the report came out, uh, a significant advance in, in uh, bi bee science was made with the publication, the release of the honeybee genome. So the entire genome of 10,000 plus genes uh, was sequenced and made uh, available. So uh, this was a product of a consortium of about 60 scientists around the world, uh, funded by NIH, USDA, and private donors, including representatives of the apiculture industry. So we actually had a, an opportunity to see what was happening to the genome of the honeybee. Uh, and the, the sequencing itself led immediately to some remarkable insights into the biology of the honeybee that people hadn't really recognized before. Two big uh, revelations were that the honeybee genome has, relative to other insect genome sequences at the time, far fewer immunity genes than do most other insects, and far fewer detoxification genes. Uh, so that was a surprise, but in retrospect made sense, in that um, the eusocial behavior of honeybees uh, may be a, a substitute for hardwired uh, genetically encoded immunity. Honeybees, for example, uh, deal with infectious agents. They can uh, produce a social fever that collectively the workers can raise the temperature of the colony, just like your body raises its temperature when you have an infectious agent. Uh, they have hygienic behavior. They groom themselves, remove parasites. They collect resins from trees uh, that have antimicrobial properties and line their colony. So behavior may have compensated for or led to a reduction in immunity genes. By the same token as well, they have this long-standing 60 million plus years of associating with consumer-friendly pollen and nectar from plants. Moreover, uh, so these are, t are tissues of plants that are, uh, well, in the case of nectar, produced solely for the purpose of, re of rewarding a mutualist, a, a, a partner, a pollinator partner. So they tend to be uh, equipped with fewer toxic substances than other more uh, uh, functional parts of the plant, plants that, uh, parts that contribute to photosynthesis and reproduction. Um, moreover, honeybees don't feed on, for the most part, raw materials. They use behavior and process pollen and nectar into honey and bee bread, which is a fermented form of pollen and themselves secrete royal jelly, which is a hypopharyngeal gland secretion. Um, and this may have led to a reduction in detoxification genes, where they are selectively feeding first on relatively uh, non-toxic raw materials and then further process them uh, in a way that may reduce their exposure to toxins. That said, that same month, October 2006, got the Honeybee Genome Project, uh, dire predictions about the future of the apiculture industry, and some disturbing news uh, from, the, from Northeast beekeepers. Uh, mysterious, uh, sudden and alarming colony losses uh, were first made in the months of October, no November, and December. Initially called fall dwindle disease, this is what became known as colony collapse disorder. Uh, a new, possibly new syndrome characterized by a disturbing disappearance of foragers. The oldest, most experienced workers in the colony simply were not there. Uh, and this is very unbee-like behavior. The eusocial nature of the bee uh, would, makes them very reluctant to leave behind their queen and their grubs and their stored food, and yet this is what was happening. So this was, for 
uh, experienced beekeepers like Dave Hackenberg, one of the first to raise the alarm, very unusual and very disturbing. By February uh, 2007, this phenomenon had been reported in over 20 states. And February 2007 is important because this state is important. February is when half of America's bees need to go to almond fields to pollinate. And California um, almond growers were quite concerned that there would not be enough bees in order to meet their pollinating, pollination needs. But the bizarre nature of the disappearing bees led to rampant wild speculation. Everyone had a pet hypothesis. Uh, Sierra Club instantly blamed um, genetically modified corn. I had just come off 18 months of reading 3,000 papers on pollinators, and there was no evidence in the literature that that was, in fact, a factor. Um, there, were, uh, there was a, a paper published, unrefereed, posted on the web, not even published, not on mobile phones. It was actually on cordless phones where the base was placed in the hive. Now, you can put a dead mouse in a hive and disturb bees. This was a base for a cordless phone. S somehow this got morphed into mobile phones, and uh, then everyone was convinced mobile phones were killing the bees. Uh, here's a, a, a theory. I heard a scientist studying collie collapse disorder. His studies show that bees are going blind, strong UV due to ozone depletion is burning out key areas of their eyes that have to do with locating flowers. Um, and here is another one that the sad state of bees dying all over the world due to the mysterious effects resulting from uh, chemical contrails, the U.S. military secret aerial misspelled spraying project. Um, and then my favorite, Soviet mind control technologies. There's the bee in the tinfoil hat. Okay, so this was based on a study that uh, Russian bees, a race of, uh, a subspecies of bees called Russian bees, subjected to uh, electromagnetic radiation in uh, frequencies of 250 hertz became more agitated. Uh, and Russian bees had been imported into the U.S. in the 90s. And this theory posits that the U.S. government, in order to gin up support for the Iraqi war, was beaming out to its citizens 250 hertz electromagnetic signals to get people agitated and aggressive. Uh, and the poor Russian bees, the descendants of the Russian bees, were caught in the crossfire. So um, there's the bee in the uh, tinfoil hat. Okay, so that's the Apis Apocalypse. Um, it was declared by April 2007. Um, and at this point, the scientific community was a little concerned. The USDA um, ARS uh, bee laboratory in Beltsville convened a meeting of about um, 50 bee researchers and other interested parties uh, to prioritize research objectives to investigate this phenomenon. So the most important thing about this meeting was discounting the less likely hypotheses. And these encountered, and these were all legitimately proposed at some point or other, genetically modified corn pollen, cell phones, Wi-Fi elevated, CO2 elevated, UVB, Osama bin Laden, automobile grills, solar maxima, chemical contrails, fluctuations of the Earth's magnetic field, Soviet-Russian mind control experience, alien abduction, abduction, and bee rapture, where bees are all summoned up to heaven and leaving us behind. Far more likely, and the focus of the scientific community, were four hypotheses that uh, insecticides, which have a long history, remember, since 1895 of killing bees, might be responsible, particularly a relatively new class called the neonicotinoids. Novel pathogen or parasites, remember there's a long sad history of introductions of, of diseases, bacterial, fungal diseases into honeybees. Um, immune suppressions relating to uh, management practices, including uh, putting bees in the back of a pickup and, or a flatbed and driving them 2,000 miles and then having them feed exclusively on almonds or decline in the nutritional adequacy of the diet, uh, for example, in, by feeding them high fructose corn syrup instead of honey. These four likely hypotheses uh, relate to the gene families that we knew from the Genome Project are already smaller than in other insects. So they're rel genes are relative, bees are relatively depauperate in detoxification genomes, uh, genes which may leave them vulnerable to pesticides, and immunity genes which may be, leave them vulnerable to novel pathogens or parasites or to immune suppression related to either dietary or management issues. So a, a really unusual collective effort uh, began across the country, interested bee scientists sharing samples collected by the USDA, uh, bee researchers, uh, in order to figure out what was causing the problem. Scientists uh, used these new genome-enabled tools. We could make really 
spectacular progress in a relatively short period of time. If, if, if there was anything fortuitous about colony collapse disorders, that it, it appeared just as the genome uh, really opened up opportunities for understanding bee biology. So microarrays, for example, this is a, a way to query the genome. Uh, this uh, micro is a, a glass slide with uh, essentially the equivalent of every gene in the honeybee genome um, that uh, is, the, so the sequence is uh, on the, the, the slide. You can extract the messenger RNA. That's, that's the uh, indication the gene is being turned on in the genome. So it's the message from the genome uh, to make proteins. And you can see which messages are being dialed up and dialed down using uh, a microarray. So you could query the genome to see how gene expression differed between bees that were identified as suffering from CCD and bees that were healthy. Uh, you could also do what was called metagenomics. Uh, and this was a way to examine what, what's in a bee that isn't part of the bee genome. So metagenome, if you have all the genes that make up a honeybee, and you grind up genetic material and extract it, if you subtract the bee genes, everything that's left is some other organism that may or may not belong there. So metagenomics allowed for the first time uh, bee biologists to see what else is in the honeybee, to see, possibly identify new pathogens. And that's the very first thing that came out of this unprecedented effort by Diana Cox Foster and her uh, colleagues was evidence of a hitherto unreported uh, virus, viral disease in uh, honeybees in, in the US. Uh, it was called, it's a really acute paralysis virus. It had been identified a few years earlier in, um, uh, uh, in Israel. Um, and uh, the, the speculation was that it arrived in the US through uh, importation of those Australian bees when uh, the almond growers had asked for the exemption from the Honey Bee Act. This almost created a, a trade crisis because the Australians we're not losing bees, and their bees were healthy. Even if they did, for example, have uh, evidence of having Israeli acute paralysis virus, they weren't dying. And in fact, uh, within a month of, of the release of that paper, uh, Judy Chen and Jay Evans went into the freezers in the USDA Beltsville lab, pulled out bees that were frozen before CCD was a phenomenon in the US, and identified Israeli acute paralysis virus. They'd been here all along, just nobody knew it was here. Uh, but a more revelatory finding from Cox Foster et al. is that these investigators found the same bacterial uh, flora in every bee they examined, healthy, sick, all over the world, Australia, uh, US, Europe, Africa. These, this was a suite of bacteria found everywhere. So this was the first indication that honeybees have a microbiome, a microbiota that they may actually depend on, just like we depend on a microbiota in our, in our guts to help with uh, processing food and, ma and maintaining general health. So the genome facilitated the discovery of a unique gut flora in the honeybee. In retrospect, it, it shouldn't have been that surprising because so many other social species are associated with mutualistic uh, symbionts, like uh, termites that rely on protozoa for digesting cellulose. Uh, and um, the leaf cutter ants that actually don't eat leaves but use leaves as substrate to grow their symbiotic fungus with. And there's now evidence that some of these bacteria found in every bee in the world may be contributing to food processing. Uh, for example, this is evidence they produce pectinases. This is, uh, these are enzymes that break down plant cell walls and may be uh, in, important in helping bees actually break down pollen. Now, among the practical applications of a symbiotic microbiome, uh, so remember, since 1955, beekeepers have been introducing antibiotics into the, um, uh, into the uh, hive to control foul brood. Well, uh, and eg examining the microbiota of honeybees revealed that, in fact, many of them have developed resistance to these antibiotics. So introducing antibiotics uh, eventually led to resistance in foul brood. In 2005, beekeepers switched to a new antibiotic, tylosin, which raised the question that maybe the appearance of CCD a year later could be linked to antibiotic disruption of the microbiota, uh, akin to how sometimes if humans are given a prescription antibiotic, all kinds of un unpleasant gastrointestinal distress uh, ensues as a result of disrupting the, the microbiome. 
Another important consequence of the of the use of of uh, of the another important consequence of microbiome, as it will, may extend beyond those resident guts. There may be an extended uh, microbiota, and the, and the uh, fact that bees don't eat raw pollen. What they do is ferment pollen to make bee bread, and that fermentation process is the result of action of many different fungi. So it's fungal fermentation, uh, and uh, we were interested in whether fungal fermentation uh, changes the phytochemical content of pollen. So uh, is there perhaps one reason that bees f process their food just like we do? We pickle food to keep, to keep it, uh, to preserve it for longer. And also the process of pickling food that we use fermentation, fungal fermentation, yeast fermentation, reduces the toxicity of certain phytochemicals. And Ling Shu Liao, one of my students, uh, examined fresh, uh, freshly collected uh, pollen on the corbicula, pollen baskets of bees, and compared it to pollen a bee bread made from pollen two weeks later, and in fact, food processing results in, in de de declines in about 28 out of 32 compounds. So food processing by bees uh, may play a role in predigesting pollen constituents. Uh, so by no January 2012, the genome had provided predictive markers for CCD. Um, there was a virus, a fungal pathogen called Nosema, a parasitic mite, Varroa, which is an old enemy, and an endocrine uh, gene called vitiligenin. Now, the, this, this was an epidemiological correlative study, but if you, uh, looking at all those agents that were implicated, there is a common factor, and that's varroa, this monster mite that was accidentally introduced in, in 1986, contributes to mul in multiple ways to bee decline. It itself is a mortality agent, kills bees directly, particularly drone pupae by, by sucking on the hemolymph. It, uh, infestation by the mites suppresses the uh, expression of immune genes. It is a vector of many of the viral pathogens, including Israeli acute paralysis virus. And it is the reason that beekeepers introduce pesticides into the, a uh, carasite into the hive, which, by the way, these pesticides also downregulate immunity genes. So it's like a quadruple whammy. And in fact, when uh, Marianne Fraser and colleagues at Penn State began to look at chemical residues in honeybees, what they found uh, without exception, in every wax sample, in every beehive they examined, were residues of the two um, mitocide, caricides that were licensed for use inside beehives, cumafos, which is an organophosphate, and fluvalinate, which is a pyrethroid, uh, as well as, uh, surprisingly, a number of fungicides. Now, the presence of fungicides in the, in the hive is, is concerning, at least in part because we know they rely on fungal partners for fermentation of bee bread. And in fact, the more fungicides in the orchards where bees forage, the, the less diverse the fungal microbiota is. Uh, so Fraser et al. used more sophisticated techniques to quantify these pesticide residues, and they were jaw-dropping. 121 different pesticides and metabolites were found in wax pollen bees and associated hive samples. Uh, almost 100% of all wax contained the two uh, caricides, and samples across all uh, hives in all locations average six pesticide detections per sample with a high of 39 different pesticides. Astonishing diversity. Uh, and Steve Shepard and colleagues showed that if bees growing, that uh, are raised in, in wax that's contaminated with pesticides, not surprisingly, do not grow well. So this is a typical size um, of a, an eight-day-old larva. This is what happens when you grow in what's effectively sick, sick building syndrome. Now, the beekeepers were in sort of the horns of a dilemma because designing an acaricide is tricky because mites are arthropods, insects are arthropods. Most insecticides are designed with low vertebrate toxicity or specificity for invertebrates, but these are both arthropods. So all of the pesticides, all the acaricides used against bees are only slightly more toxic to the mite than they are to the honeybee. And in fact, um, of the, among the pyrethroids, talfuvalinate is used as apistan, but other pyrethroids are highly toxic to, to bees. So until 2013, only these, only these two were approved for use, and resistance quickly developed. Now, what was astonishing to me is that beekeepers were dumping pesticides into the hives without having any clue how bees even processed them. So uh, it, would, it, it was it incumbent upon us to figure out which enzyme systems were contributing to the ability of bees to, 
to process uh, and uh, eliminate pesticides. So there are three major classes of detoxification enzymes in all aerobic organisms. There are the so-called tetragram P450s, we'll call them P450s, the carboxylesterases, and the glutathione S transferases. And no one at that point even knew which enzymes were most important. All three classes of detoxification genes are reduced in honeybees. Um, so one of the first things my student, Jean uh, Reed Johnson, did was to use specific inhibitors for each class of detoxification enzyme to see which ones potentiated or increased the toxicity the most. So he used uh, an inhibitor of the GSTs, an inhibitor of the esterases, an inhibitor of the P450s. This is the LD50, the least lethal dose that kills 50% of the bees. So the lower the LD50, the more toxic. You can see where all the blue lines are. Whenever you have a PBO, an inhibitor P450s, toxicity in, is enhanced. So P450s are, are crucial to the ability of bees to tolerate these pesticides. And what Reed also found out is P450s are used in, in metabolizing both of these pesticides, and in fact, they synergize each, each other. A non-toxic dose of uh, one miticide, like tylofluvalinate, in the presence of Kumafos becomes highly toxic. So this combination of pesticide residues suggested that individual LD50s are not going to be informative because they interact with each other. Uh, so most organisms, including insects, rely on these P450s. And this is a very large gene superfamily. Every genome has dozens to hundreds. And even though the honeybee is strikingly deficient in P450 genes, there were still 46 of them for us to sort through to try to identify which P450s were involved. So Reed very cleverly noticed which of the subfamilies of P450, there's 46 P450s, but they're divided up by sequence. There are 11,000 named P450s, and percent identity determines which subfamily they're in. And the CYP6AS uh, genes were actually more numerous in this reduced inventory than they were in the close, well, the other hymenopteran genome available at the time, the Sony the Trepanus, a wasp genome. So Reed figured that, was, must be, that must be the set of P450s that's unique to being a honeybee. So that's where we started looking for P450s. And sure enough, um, these were specifically the P450s upregulated uh, when honeybees ate honey. So eating honey turns on these genes. And now we didn't know what in honey was potentially being metabolized. So my postdoc, Wen Fu Mao, was able to construct a molecular model of the CYPS enzymes and use what's called in silico high throughput docking. That means we have a molecular model. We can take um, a, a library of chemical structures and then by the computer see which chemical structures out of, of thousands see, fit into the catalytic site. And out of the 14,000 plus compounds that were uh, computationally docked, what kept coming out consistently were these flavonoids, particularly quercetin. And this is a, a flavonoid that is present in just about every kind of honey, every kind of pollen. And it makes sense that these are the enzymes that metabolize the normal food. But they were not the ones that were metabolizing pesticides. You can take these P450s and express them in what's called a hetero heterologous system. Get insect cell lines. You can drop the gene, uh, or the, yeah, the, basically drop the coding part of the gene into these uh, cells. Uh, by use of a virus called a baculovirus, and the cell line starts making the enzyme, and you can actually test what the enzyme can metabolize. So it's, it's called heterologous expression. Uh, and these CYP6ASs were not metabolizing uh, the pesticides, so we weren't done yet. When, when Fu went back into the gut to see which of the P450s were overexpressed in the gut, the gut is where insects tend to metabolize foreign substances, including pesticides, because that's how they get into the in insect. They're generally ingested. The CYP9Qs were, were, in fact, very prominent. When he expressed them heterologously, sure enough, they metabolized both miticides as well as uh, quercetin. And uh, so he used molecular models and th to dock both of the acaricides into the catalytic site. Heterologous expression confirmed their activity. Moreover, it explained the synergism. Honeybees have very few detoxifying P450s, and apparently um, the two mitocytes were competing for access to the catalytic site, which is why they synergize each other. There was only so much this one, in, this one particular P4, group of P450s could handle. So bees may be especially prone to synergistic interactions among pesticides because they have so few xenobiotic metabolizing P450s. Remember, the environment in which they uh, evolved 
They were accustomed to a few dietary toxins, including the flavonoids in nectar and pollen, um, occasionally maybe a mycotoxin from molds. But then they were encountering um, the caricides directly in their own homes, introduced by beekeepers, and as well, non-hive pesticides whenever they traveled through the you know, uh, U.S. pesticide sat sat saturated agroecosystems. And in fact, the potential for synergistic interactions in beehive are almost limitless. Remember those 121 uh, pesticides and metabolites. So other labs have shown, here's uh, again the Fraser lab at, at uh, Penn State showing that the fungicide chlorothalonil, which was the third most common contaminant found in honeybees, hives, interacts with the, the mitocides to increase mortality. Moreover, uh, Mullen et al. And, and Penn State showed that even the inert ingredients in pesticides can kill bees. So they may not be so inert after all. So uh, the honeybees were not well equipped to deal with the, with the synthetic world and in fact made us wonder uh, so there's six million years before pesticides were invented, bees diversified their P450s. So honey and bee bread, not sucrose, or what bees, uh, honey bees eat, are high fructose corn syrup. So we wanted to find what chemicals in the natural diet of honey bees contain, uh, were present in honey that could interact with pesticides. So when Fu separated out uh, different uh, fractions of honey, uh, looked to see uh, which fractions upregulated the, the um, detoxification, and we identified four really surprising compounds. Three of them were actually not from, not best known from honey at all. They're present in honey, but they're basically present in propolis. Propolis is that resin with which everything in the beehive is uh, lined. Propolis uh, components were sh not only showing up in the honey, but were turning on detoxification gene. But the best inducer of, uh, or of regulator of of P450s was this compound, P-cumeric acid, which is present in every bite of every natural food that bees eat because it is the monomer in the polymer, the multi-unit compound uh, that's called sporopollenin. It is the major cell wall constituent of all pollen grains. So it's everywhere in what bees eat. So we were wondering, well, it, you know, it's a great signal then for the honeybee to regulate, uh, it, uh, to know that food is coming in. What else is upregulated by P-cumeric acid? We were astonished to see with laser-like pre precision in adult honeybees, P-cumeric acid upregulates all three of the detoxification gene families. And, and in fact, the, the familiar ones that we know are involved in detoxification, the CYP6AS and the CYP9Qs, all turned on by P-cumeric acid, as were the uh, um, phase two and phase three detoxification genes. And then also to our surprise, the immunity genes. There are at least uh, one, and then uh, depending on streams, you see two different immunity genes, antimicrobial peptide genes were upregulated by P-cumeric acid. So basically honey is a functional food for bees. It upregulates their, both their immunity genes and their detoxification genes. And in fact, if you feed de bees honey, and give them aflatoxin, which is a naturally occurring mycotoxin that, occur, that is found in the hive, produced by Aspergillus fungi, with which bees cohabit. It actually enhances their ability to metabolize it over high fructose corn syrup. Moreover, we just recently, and this isn't published yet, completed RNA-seq analysis of the larvae, and essentially the same subset of uh, P450s and immunity genes, you can see even more immunity genes, are upregulated in both larvae and worker adults in response to peak cumaric um, uh, acid. Even more surprising, astonishing actually, peak cumaric acid, which is in honey and presumably pollen, affects expression of just about every gene that's known to be involved in caste differentiation. So feeding queen destined larvae, feed, the way bees create queens is they feed them only royal jelly. And people have been looking in royal jelly for years for that magic agent that turns them into queens. Well, apparently, not eating honey is what turns them into queens, because P-cumeric acid interferes with caste differentiation, or uh, queen-destined caste differentiation. This is all brand new and not published yet, which I hope it holds up. But to all together, this um, suggests that maybe feeding them high fructose corn syrup is not such a good idea. Uh, if anything, it may compromise detoxification and immunity. 
And thanks to unscrupulous dealers, not even honey is honey anymore. So beekeepers who think they're feeding their bees honey may be feeding them high fructose corn syrup because ultrafiltration uh, is now a common practice to remove the pollen to make determining the nation of origin almost impossible. And in fact, identifying adulterants isn't very easy. Without pollen, you don't know if it's honey. You remove the pollen, it's easy to mix in high fructose corn syrup. You know, to differentiate high fructose corn syrup from honey requires very expensive uh, and very sophisticated chemical analytical techniques that are based on differences in isotope ratios of corn and monocots and dicots. So adulteration is rampant, which has led to a phenomenon called honey laundering, uh, which is uh, it sounds comical, but it is enormously important. Uh, it's Kim Flottam and Bee Culture wrote, honey laundering undermines the credibility of the entire honey sector. The image and reputation of honey as a safe and wholesome food is put into question. Such schemes mean there's greater risk of adulterated honey products being sold as pure honey in the U.S. food chain with increased potential residues entering the food supply. How is that? Okay, this is what honey laundering is. Uh, it's trans-shipping honey. So up until the U.S. imposed uh, strict import duties on honey from China, where labor costs are quite cheap. Honey, China was the leading honey producer. You notice between 2006 and 2007 an astonishing drop in the amount of Chinese honey being brought into the U.S. and an astonishing increase in the supply of honey from many countries, such as Malaysia and Vietnam and Taiwan, that have no commercial beekeeping industry, which is how do you export honey if you don't have honeybees? So what was happening is that there were trans-shipping. Chinese honey was being shipped elsewhere, relabeled, and brought into the U.S. Moreover, in this trans-shipping, many of the, of, much of the, of the Chinese honey was profoundly adulterated, not only with high fructose corn syrup, but pollutant of uh, pesticides, antibiotics, and the like. And this was hugely important. So and basically, you can, uh, well, in 2008 and 2009, at least 80 million pounds of Chinese origin honey entered the U.S. Uh, without paying the anti-dumping fee. This was uncollected duties representing 200 million in lost revenues for the U.S. Treasury during a two-year period. Uh, so in 2009, circumvented honey imports were 44% of total imports. Huge problem. And, and it, the, uh, much to their credit, the government went after these unscrupulous importers, and there were a number of high-profile arrests uh, that were um, involved enormous sums of money, which led, uh, and then this was ongoing for a couple of years, and ultimately honey laundering is now the largest food fraud in the history of, the U of U.S. food, and we've had a lot of food frauds. One last problem as we go into overtime, um, I had that AV problem. Uh, okay, the size and the perennial nature of honeybee colonies necessitates the collection of nectar and pollen from an astonishingly broad diversity of flower species. They need different species year-round, from, basically from early spring to late fall, so they need a diversity. They have evolved to use a diversity of pollen and nectar sources. Unfortunately, in the U.S., they're losing that diversity. Uh, and, and, for example, in this study, this is a ratio of the proportion of open land to developed land. So um, the, when the proportion of open land to developed land is low, then you have very high proportion of colony loss. So the, the greater the proportion of open land to developed land, the more undeveloped land, the better bee survival is. So this uh, particular figure shows that bees need a diversity of food sources. Habitat loss may also contribute to some of, these some of these colony losses. Now, and it's not just honey, nectar and pollen that bees need. In addition to foraging for nectar and pollen, some workers visit other parts of the environment. They collect water for thermal regulation. They need plant resins for producing propolis. Uh, they may be uh, exposed to pesticides in, in new ways people haven't thought of. Uh, the use of systemic uh, seed treatments, for example, means that uh, gutation water, the water that oozes out of transpiring plants in the morning like, like dew may contain neonics which go systemic because they are used in, to treat seeds. Nobody knows whether or not bees can detect these and whether the, how, much, how important gutation fluids are. Um, they certainly get uh, exposed to many, many pesticides as they forage through the landscape. And 
there are fewer and fewer flowers, which leads to this sort of phenomenon, where um, in France, beekeepers were alarmed to see blue and green honey being produced by their bees. And it turns out that the bees were visiting a nearby biogas uh, facility where tons of, of M&Ms were being dumped for biofuel uh, processing. And the bees, knowing a good thing, um, were uh, visiting the blue and green M&Ms and making honey out of them. And here's red honey from Red Hook uh, in Brooklyn, where the beekeeper was alarmed with bright red honey. And it turns out down the block from uh, the beekeeper was a maraschino cherry factory, which the bees were visiting in order to make honey. When there are no flowers, you just have to make do. And here you see bees choose Pepsi. Um, given the th but I think given their druthers, they'd rather choose the flowers. So will there be flowers for bees? Uh, well, there are a number of programs in the works. Um, Minnesota is part of a $3 million uh, five-state project aimed at encouraging farmers to adopt pollinator-friendly practices. Uh, the Almond Board here in California has invested more in, into colony collapse disorder than any other industry group. Uh, Almond uh, Board is working, actually, with, with uh, bee biologists and beekeepers to try to figure out ways to diversify um, almond orchards and contribute to bee nutrition. Um, people ask, what can you do to help the bees? I'm often asked that. Um, one is plant pollinator-friendly flowers, avoid the freakish mutant monsters that, uh, that horticulture and floriculture catalogs promote that provide no nectar or pollen resources. Um, be a little tolerant of weeds. What you call a weed could be a, a bountiful meal for a bee. Um, and uh, probably most importantly, support your local beekeepers, buy local honey. Um, Thank you, and I guess, there, I don't know if there's time for questions, but thanks for listening. there to be one solution. You know, it's neonics, ban the neonics, everything's fixed. And unfortunately, it's clearly many different factors. Um, I don't want to, I'm not trying to demonize beekeepers. I often tell beekeepers, um, I, I am a, I'm not a bee, I'm actually only latecomer to bee biology. I know very little practical information. I would not, for example, beekeepers ask, should we give our bees p-chromatic acid? That's not for me to say. It has to be tested. Um, University of Illinois keeps an apiary on land that we have a pollinator meadow, so I'm a bee landlord, but not a beekeeper. They manage the colony. Um, but I would, uh, what we desperately need are better controls for Varroa other than these synthetic organic pesticides, uh, including from, um, Amitraz, which is a formamidine neurotoxin that's been shown to impair behavior in Drosophila melanogaster, which is not nearly as smart as bees. Um, so the, you can't, I mean, beekeepers are, can't be faulted for resorting to pesticides because there aren't many other options. There has not been much of a research push into finding um, less toxic alternatives for, uh, there tend to be labor intensive, alternatives to these pesticides. And from, actually, Amitraz was not legal. I mean, it was not licensed for bee use until 2013. Uh, it was on the market and was taken off the market. So. Um, there's a lot of off-label use of a lot of pesticides, not just by beekeepers, but by a lot of growers as well. So um, I, I, I hate to make recommendations, but I think um, recycling wax does not seem to be like a good idea. I mean, even if there's, you know, substantial cost savings, just looking at the residues in recycled wax is alarming. And that, there's enough evidence from that, that those residues can affect growth. And, but that's an expense. And beekeeping, in general, is a very marginal business. It's not like many people can get independently wealthy. A lot of people are sideliners. So um, I, 
I'm not, I, I do think when people, this one reason I end with plant more flowers, because ultimately good nutrition will help you deal with whatever the stresses are. It's the same thing for people. If you are starving or not properly nourished, then you'll have more trouble with toxins, you'll have more trouble with, with diseases, you'll have more trouble with adjusting to new environments. So good nutrition is absolutely fundamental. One of the most devastating years in terms of losses was 2012-2013, which is like 33% overwintering loss, coincided with the great Midwestern drought, where beekeepers were running out of things to get feed food, food for their bees. So I think uh, the very simplest thing to do is to diversify the landscape and provide resources for bees, because no matter what the triggers are, whatever the stress factors are, being well-nourished is going to be a good um, uh, a step up for them. I don't know if that answers the question or dodges the question. I don't know. They're not as what? Innocent as oh. Uh, well, you know, it, it's, it's been an, in, I'm an out, kind of an outsider, and the beekeeping community has been uh, fascinating uh, for me, because as an outsider, because um, I'll hear, I went to the 2013 American uh, Beekeeping Federation meeting, never been to one of those before. This is the meeting, uh, January 2013, remember, this was the year that Amitraz was approved. And beekeepers were cheering, even though they'd been obviously using it off-label for many years because there's mite populations resistant to amitraz. So they obviously have been using it. And these are the very same beekeepers in the same meeting who um, were at a talk being given by Tom Steger from the EPA, shaking their fists about banning neonicotinoids as, as killing their bees. Like, you know, they're both classes of, of neurotoxic pesticides, you know? And, and at least the neonics, the bees have a chance of dodging them. But when they're in your own home, the bees have no alternative. I mean, the, it was uh, kind of a reflection out of me, 1950s thinking that, that you could just introduce these pesticides into um, an environment and not have lasting effects. I don't think anybody knew quite how long these pesticides lingered, but wax you know, all these are, are lipophilic, fat-soluble compounds, and wax is nothing but fat, and it just, it's a sponge for these organic uh, pesticides. Just soaks them up, never lets go. So I, I, think, well, I think there's been a lot of improvement. Actually, overwintering success this year, you probably saw the recent report, was down to, I think, was it 23%? In 2011, 2012, which nobody remembers, it was 21.5%. People don't remember because that doesn't make good headlines. You know, Survival increase, uh, improves. That's not a, a scary headline. So much of the public perception is driven by the need for journalists to tell a simple story. And unfortunately, this is not a simple story. Um, uh, you know, I, I've gotten hate mail, actually, from often misspelled, <laughs> um, including bees, you know, uh, and pesticides. Those are uh, frequently misspelled. Basically, for suggesting that banning in the EU, was it three neonics were banned on two crops. Um, there's at least nine registered neonics. I'm not sure what the point of banning only a few of them might be. Plus, in the US, growers will still use chemicals. So you should, before you ban them, you should find out what alternative chemicals they're going to use, because they're going to use old chemistries, which we already know are very bad for bees. Look at the pyrethroids, which have been around since the 70s. Uh, are very toxic to bees, with the exception of a couple like Taupu Valini. And these are all now off-label, not off-label, um, off-patent and cheap. So, you know, it, it, there, you have to consider the whole agro-ecosystem to figure out the, the best solution. And, and it's happening. People are working together, which is the best thing to come out of all this. The, there are clear evidence that, that the sticking agent that was being used to treat the seeds with... Um, with fungicide and, uh, and neonics, corn and soybean seeds, was not effective. And enormous clouds of pesticide were released just as bees were flying through the landscape. And there were bee kills. So uh, there have, a corn dust consortium was formed involving uh, bee researchers, the producers of the sticking agent, the producers of the seed, and, and uh, other interested parties to figure out a solution to that particular part of the problem. And I think that's how we're going to have to deal with bee health is 
focusing on the individual problems and not trying to find the one blanket solution, which is not going to fix a million different problems. So I don't know if that's a long, complicated answer to. Yeah, Basically, such a long answer. We're going to end the question here. <laughs> Same time, same place, tomorrow evening. He'll give another seminar, so please, you are all invited to come. Let's thank you. Thank you for listening.